Today, as you probably know, we're here for the webinar, What is Trauma and How to Heal from It, hosted by the Mental Health Coalition. Uh, I'm really excited for this topic, excited to be here with you all coming from the Mental Health Coalition. Tiny bit of background for those of you who don't know. So here at MHC, we are a collection of the leading mental health organizations across the United States. Uh, we work together to end silence, provide resources, reduce stigma, and engage community around the crucial topic of mental health. So today for this webinar, we have some excellent panelists. Um, I'll be your host for the afternoon. I'll be moderating the panel. But before I introduce our lovely experts, I just want to set the stage for the topic at hand. We are going to be considering trauma, uh, which we know from research is incredibly and unfortunately very common. 70% of people, so seven out of 10 people will experience trauma in their lifetimes. So we'll be talking about that. We'll be talking about PTSD, different forms of PTSD and trauma, how the effects of trauma show up in our daily lives, whether it's in our minds or our bodies, our relationships. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, we're going to hear about the ways to cope with trauma and PTSD. We'll also have some time at the end for questions. So if you have any questions, that's wonderful. Uh, we'll be sure to check in on that at the end and, and hear what they are. So I'll first tell you a little bit about me, and then I'll ask each of our lovely panelists to introduce themselves. I'm Dr. Naomi Torres Mackey. I am a Brooklyn-based psychologist. I focus on the integration of mental wellness into everyday life. Um, I practice clinically at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York, where I specialize in severe mental health, uh, women's mental health, reproductive mental health, and trauma resiliency, which is part of the reason I'm very excited to be here today. I'm also the head of research at the Mental Health Coalition. I teach in psychology programs at Columbia University. I'm also the co-founder of Nascent Consulting, which um, utilizes psychology and social justice-based approaches to improving organizational wellness. I also regularly contribute uh, to media as an expert source. So that's a bit about me. I will pass it to Dr. Luana if you wanna introduce yourself, please. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Naomi, for having us today. I'm excited to be here with everybody. I'm Dr. Luana. I'm Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. I'm a clinical psychologist as well. I trained as a cognitive behavior therapist. And for the last 20 years, I've been here at Harvard at Mass General, um, really trying to bring CBT out of the ivory tower and into inner city communities. And so my passion is really thinking about therapy as skills. And so I work with young men coming out of prison, um, single mothers in poverty, um, disseminating the skills. I'm also an author. I have a book just released a month ago, Bold Move, a three-step plan to transform anxiety into power. Um, and I'm delighted to be here, not as only a professional, but as a young kid, I saw a lot of domestic violence in my life, in my mom's um, at home and really today dedicate to ensure that women and men and all of us have the skills that we can to really stop trauma. And so I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lana, for being here. Uh, Jason, would you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Jason Phillips, licensed clinical social worker and college professor. I teach in the School of Social Work at Fayetteville State University. And I also regularly contribute to media. And I'm host of the Peace and Prosperity podcast. My, uh, my experience with trauma has been working with veterans in multiple VAs and with the active duty military population throughout my career. So thank you. Great to have you. Thanks, Jason. Thank Dr. You. Kate, do you mind introducing yourself? Absolutely. And thank you, Naomi, for inviting all of us to be here today. It's a wonderful topic and a very important one. Uh, my name is Dr. Kate, licensed clinical psychologist, as well as an applied neuroscientist. I specialize in the integration of neuroscience into the field of mental health, specifically as it pertains to trauma, stress, and of course, resilience. I am an author. I've written uh, Healing in Your Hands, which is all about the integration of neuroscience into each individual's unique healing journey and how we can harness the power of the brain to create long-term sustainable change for all, because we know access to mental health 
is a privilege and it is not a right. And our brain is capable of changing. And I have another book coming out that is all about ending the silence and reducing stigma right along with the MHC uh, vision and utilizes my own journey through PTSD, which I struggled with for five years, and my relationship with my brain and what it's like to be a trauma expert felled by the thing that we're an expert in. So I have a clinic here in Los Angeles, a training institute, as well as a research foundation that's all about how do we take neuroscience, take mental health, and disseminate it at a global level so everybody can have mental health and mental wellness. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Kate, for being here and, and everybody for being here. This is um, this is very exciting. We have really wonderful experts in our midst. Um, so let's start off by kind of setting the scene. Trauma has become a bit of a buzzword lately. Uh, so why don't we start by just defining trauma and PTSD? Maybe we can think about how they're similar and, and how they're different. And this question, all the questions are for any of you. I guess I'll jump in. Then. So trauma, as we know, is prolific. And just because we've experienced trauma does not mean that we will develop PTSD. I think one of the most compelling pieces of data I learned in my graduate studies was that individuals who have recurrent depression, so depression that keeps returning, have experienced four to six more in adverse childhood experiences than the normal population. So trauma can arise in many different symptoms and neurobiological presentations that impact the mind and body. And then PTSD is a specific symptom cluster. And I'll open that up too. I'd love to hear, Jason and Luano, your thoughts as well. Uh, I'll jump in. When we think about PTSD, we're looking at certain symptoms such as intrusive thoughts, reliving the traumatic experience, hypervigilance or hyperarousal, meaning you may feel like you're on guard. You have to watch or scan your perimeter. And over time, that becomes very um, impairing. So while we may experience trauma, if there's not an isolated event or it doesn't reach the criteria for PTSD, it's not to say that the trauma wasn't significant, but it's not impacting our functioning the same way we would address PTSD. And, I, and I'll add that it's important to distinguish the two because the treatment will look different when you're addressing maybe childhood trauma versus PTSD from a certain traumatic event. I fully agree with you guys. And I think the, the it's, you know, this experience that patients describe often sort of being on, on guard watching, right? You're going to a restaurant and you have to know where the door is, a little noise and you're jumpy. You can't sleep because you have racing thoughts. You may have flashbacks. And I really like what, you know, Jason, you were just talking about this idea. There's a spectrum here right? That there is sort of, think about this as sort of a fever that can go from mild to really severe. But as, as long as it's impacting your life in a negative way, or your ability to connect with others, sometimes, you know, I've had patients that say, no, I'm okay, okay, but I won't be in a relationship again, or I won't go to this place because I'm so scared. And so as long as it starts to interfere with your life, it's really important to start to think about is this following the trauma to PTSD spectrum and how can I get good help? Yeah, amazing. That's super helpful to think about, um, to think about this as a spectrum and both kind of the, the overlap and then the differences as well. I'm wondering too, you know, our understanding, I think as a society kind of outside of the mental health professional world, um, our understanding of PTSD has, has, evolved over time. And, you know, I think originally there was a lot of linking of PTSD and, and combat and veterans. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, your all understanding of how trauma and how PTSD affects kind of uh, various populations and, and what that looks like. Yeah, I, I'll jump in and say that um, having particularly worked with the military, a lot of times PTSD is can be synonymous with the military or a veteran. Um, but working with active duty soldiers and veterans at, uh, at large, when I'm working with them on specific traumas, a lot of times it's not from combat. They mm -hmm. may have experienced childhood trauma, which mm -hmm. uh, elevated to PTSD, or sometimes there's domestic abuse or sexual trauma, MST, military sexual trauma. 
And that is not related to combat experience. So I think it's really good that we are having this conversation because so often we kind of lump in deployments with PTSD or veterans with PTSD, but there are so many different um, experiences or traumatic events that we can we can have that are not related to the military or combat. Yeah, I definitely want to piggyback on that. And we, we know when it comes to individuals who are currently in the military, most of them have survived six or more ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. And a lot of times we've been very blessed to do trainings with the military and to walk alongside the, you mentioned military sexual trauma, uh, SAPR, the Sexual Abuse Prevention and Response Program, and do some work with them as well. And the military is seen as a way out of really difficult, painful experiences. And those individuals are vulnerable when they're coming into a deployment setting that is intense and you know, meaningful work and intense. And so when we look at the through line of the developmental trajectory, if we're exposed to hard things in our childhood, that can create a vulnerability that then an onset of PTSD or the experience of trauma as an adult makes it more likely that the symptoms will be more severe or will have greater life interference. And so it is that spectrum of experiences. Everywhere we go, our brain goes. And so what our brain has experienced walks along beside us. And we have the opportunity and the resilient side to build the skills and the capacity to create change. And that is also possible. I love this, this piece. And I, I want to add one more piece, which is not just about what type of event, right? But is what the event does to our brain, to your point, um, Dr. Kate, in our view of the world. And so, and often I have patients ask, well, is this, this, is this a traumatic event? Well, if your interpretation of it is that your life was in danger, it created a threat and it changed your view of yourself and the world, then for sure, yes. I did a lot of research, for example, on car accident survivors in graduate school. And that, it was well, almost 20 years ago, it was the beginning of us understanding that a severe car accident can lead to PTSD. So can, of course, a rape and combat and being held at gunpoint. So I think it's not just to focus on the events. I think what had to answer your question, I think, Naomi, what has changed significantly is our understanding that the event has an impact on the individual that is creating all those host of symptoms that's now leading to distress and interference. Or, yeah, and I really, I appreciate your point, Dr. Luana, kind of about empowerment of the individual who's experienced the trauma in terms of this questioning of was this trauma? Do I deserve to feel like this was trauma, et cetera? But kind of, as you were saying, you know, if the individual, if it was traumatic to them, you know, and if it had that impact for them, then yes, it's trauma. And I, I think that, again, can be very empowering. Um, and Dr. Kate, you, you brought up ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. And I, I wanted to circle back to that and Kind of maybe you and, and others can help illum illuminate for us, like how how do ACEs impact the way we view ourselves and and the world around us? What does that look like? Yeah, but, and so adverse childhood experiences came out of an incredible study that was done by Kaiser, Dr. Folletti, that really transformed our understanding of how childhood experiences and traumatic, stressful experience across the course of a life impacts our brain and how we show up later in our world, to Dr. Luana's point, our experience of self and self in the world around us. And I want to put a plug in for mynumberstory.org, which is an incredible organization. And so if you want to learn more, any of our listeners about ACEs, go to that website and you can dig in deeper and explore your own journey. One of the things that I really specialize in is the amygdala. It's my favorite brain part. All brain parts are very, very cool and welcome. And it's my favorite. And it, she gets a bad rep. I lovingly call her Amy the amygdala. And she is our fiercest warrior protector. And her job is to basically make sure we can keep breathing, that we stay alive. And we like to consider the fact that she has some primary core values, such as safety, love, belonging, and success. Success being making getting our core needs met, not money in the bank or the car that we drive. And as a child, we're trying to figure out how to meet those needs. And our amygdala is guiding that. If I'm loud and 
vocal as an infant and our caretakers show up and applaud and love us for it, we go, oh, expression safe. If we're loud and then we're ignored or we're hurt for being loud, we learn expression's not safe. We start to play off the environment around us and that curates the way our brain is making sense of self in the world because self develops in adolescence and our amygdala is on board before we're even born. And so our sense of safety, belonging, lovability, and ability to get our core needs met designs our development across the course of our lives. I'll add to that. As far as um, ACEs, I think one unique thing about ACEs, a lot of us have experienced trauma in our childhood that we have not acknowledged or recognized as trauma. So often when I'm asking the series of questions to gain more background information about what my, my client has been through, they'll, they'll say things like, I've never talked about this, or I've never looked at this in this manner before. So meaning maybe they did experience neglect, or they witnessed abuse, or they had a parent who wasn't there, but they just thought that that was the norm. So when you get into a different setting, and you are exposed to trauma, and now you feel those signs more deeply or more intensely, it's very helpful because you can often pinpoint, oh, this reminds me of what I experienced in my childhood too. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think the interesting thing about ACEs as well is that we know that the more ACEs we have in childhood, the more difficulties we can have, right? We're more likely to use drugs and alcohol and, and get into trouble uh, to drop out of a school. And of course, has a very disproportionate effect in a minority populations and in diverse, racial diverse populations who are more likely to experience ACEs and have less um, help for it. And yeah. If I could add in one more little piece there, if I may, because when we're looking at you know reducing shame and highlighting the human experience in the world around us, people who've survived complicated childhoods who have what are known as the ACEs experiences, which are kind of acute experiences that are identified, but we have to really be mindful of the developmental trajectory of living in a house of chaos or danger, living in a community of chaos and danger. The there's a significant increase in the likelihood of experiencing suicidal considerations, of leaning into substances as a way to disconnect or dissociate from the world around us. And that's because our mind and our body are looking for a way out of the pain. It's not because there's anything necessarily wrong or broken, but when we're in that space, it can feel that way. It's actually our mind and our brain, our little friend, Amy, the amygdala saying, this is too much. I need a way to dampen this. Or as we say in my clinic here, exit stage left because the pain is too heavy. And to Jason's really wonderful point, these are experiences that begin so early and they can feel so isolating and even normal. And that isolation, yeah. we're not alone. You're not alone if you're experiencing this. Yeah, Dr. Kate, um, briefly, when you said community, that is true because I'm from Detroit. So a lot of things that those questions on the ACEs are very much normalized, you know, with people who are in my community. So we don't think that there's something wrong with it. We just think that this is how, how we've lived. Yeah. Yeah. And this idea of um, trauma starting so early, it is an important one. And it's actually making me think of how early it can start. Um, it can start generations before we're even born, you know, and, and the, this term cycle breaker, making me think of um, in reference to, you know, somebody intentionally changing multi-generational family patterns, you know, that have come out of experiences of trauma, often because of systemic inequity. Uh, so I'm very much as you all are are speaking and reflecting and thinking about, you know, the systemic factors that are at play here and just the intersection of trauma and, and social inequity, social justice, and wonder if, if we could kind of directly address that. And, and if you all could speak a bit just about what that relationship is, is like, um, and then I definitely want to move into like a, a space of healing and, and how to address you know, these things and create healing. Um, but yeah, whoever wants to jump in, go ahead. 
I'll jump in. Um, I think Jason already beautifully sort of started there, which is, you know, the beliefs of our culture and, and it guides so much of what we interpret to be traumatic or not. And I'll give you a personal example. When I first came to the U.S. and I was um, first starting trauma, you know, one of the questions is, have you ever been held at gunpoint? And everybody in my class would be like, that would be so scary. And I was like, oh, really? Because I thought that was just something that happens. And they go, what do you mean? I said, well, in Brazil, especially in big cities like Sao Paulo and Belo Horizonte, what happens, and I grew up in Brazil, is that everybody has a second wallet and a second watch so that if somebody holds you up at a gunpoint and a traffic light, you just give it away. And though for them, that interpretation it is that that's not unsafe, right? For me now, shifting from Brazil to the US, now, if somebody held me at gunpoint, I'd be terrified, right? Because that threat to my life feels like a real threat versus to my friends to this day, it feels like it's part of the culture. So some of this is our cultural context, and some of it is, is what our culture says it's okay. Another one that I think is really downplayed in Latin cultures is domestic violence. To this day, within a Latin culture, it's okay for a woman to be, a woman to be beaten up, which we know it's not. We know it's traumatic. And yet the culture continues to perceptate this. So we need to sort of think about the, the systems that we live in and ways to break those perceptions. I'll elaborate. You know, one of the questions for childhood or adverse childhood experiences, was there a parent or adult in the home who was either incarcerated, involved in the legal system, used substances? And in a lot of communities, it's common to just have one parent in the home. So when you're at answering yes to that question, you're not thinking that you're at a disadvantage because it's been normalized and sometimes often justified to grow up in a single parent household. Yeah, well, and shifting the conversation a little bit to resilience piece to circle back to Dr. Luano, what you were sharing about the cultural context. My, my husband grew up in Mumbai, and it's, it's when you shared that story, Dr. Luana, he has that exact same story growing up in India. Of, mm. Here's how you navigate the world. And when there is the collective experience and everybody is navigating within that same journey there to the point of the normalization that happens, and that can also be a protective variable for the brain because there, there's not that sense of isolation. It's not the sense of I've been attacked or shamed because of who I am. Whereas, and I'm not saying, and, and I want to be mindful in America, there are some very specific endemic factors culturally and how our nation navigates the world that we all know have been more and more complicated. Um, but there is that sense of when we're not in it alone, that's protective in of itself. And our brain needs to know and wants to know we have a community. And so I think there's a really powerful opportunity and how can we all lift each other up as communities and disseminate information to the point of what MHC is doing with the trauma and PTSD roadmap, providing this information as a collective so that we all know, hey, there is a possibility of another way. Absolutely, that the importance of connection, you know, in my understanding of trauma, it, it serves to disconnect, disconnect you from other people, from the world, from yourself, it has a very dis disconnecting effect. And like you're saying, Dr. Kate, just the importance of connecting as, as a form of healing. Um, and so I wonder to elaborate on that. And yes, and we dropped the PTSD roadmap in the chat. So thank you, MHC. And, and just a little bit of context. This is a, a free open resource to anybody. Um, and it's basically a guide to trauma and PTSD, both understanding them and developing ways of healing and coping. And we have a lot of resources in there from our partner organizations as well. So feel free to, to check that out and hang on to it for yourself or for others. Um, but yeah, so I, I wanted to kind of build on that, Dr. Kate, this idea of connection and how important this is in the face of trauma and PTSD. So taking kind of the next step, what is what does that look like? Like what maybe advice do you have or suggestions for building connection, whether or not it, it's to other people, to a community, or, or even to oneself and reconnecting with yourself? What can this look like? 
I'll start. I'll say it looks like being able to talk about your experiences in a safe space where you don't feel judged. Mm -hmm. So often people, we may know that someone's been through a traumatic experience and we're thinking, how can we help? Well, we can help by listening, but listen without judging. So when you're asking questions about what somebody's been through, be mindful of your tone, certain words that you use, body language, because you may ask a question in a certain way and how you ask that question may be very off-putting to the person, or it could be demeaning. Why didn't you do this? Or why did you let that happen? So you want to make sure that you're not blaming someone as you're trying to build rapport and express empathy. I love that, Jason. And I also think it's so important for us to understand that sometimes when we have friends or colleagues or people that we love that had a traumatic event, sometimes we don't want to engage. We're like, well, we don't want them to suffer. We don't want them to talk about it. But this is the reality. If you experience a traumatic event, the narrative and the stories in your brain all the time, so you're not really making somebody, and, and I'm not suggesting you make them talk, but inviting them to have a conversation, saying, I'm here for you. And when you're ready, if you want to share, I can support you. I think it's really important because it has a lot of healing for people to understand that they're not broken. There isn't something wrong with them. They went through something really challenging, but that support system is theirs. And we know the social support is one of the best buffers against, you know, um, any mental health concerns, including PTSD. In fact, in my dissertation, I did a study longitudinally of people who had a severe car accident. And what we found is people who had strong relationships were much less likely to develop PTSD over time. And so connecting can really be a buffer and help change the trajectory of the course of somebody after a traumatic event. Now, um, Dr. Ronald Rudin, who's the, one of the creators of the Havening Techniques, has a wonderful acronym for how to define an experience as traumatic or not, which is an EMILY, an event happened, the meaning making of the event, the landscape, and the sense of inescapability. And we can have an EMILY moment, which our brain is going to remember and say, oof, that was a threat to my life and not immediately develop PTSD. Actually, the literature shows that PTSD develops traditionally anywhere from eight to 12 months after the traumatic experience. And in that window of time, there is a huge opportunity for the community to show up to the MHC you know, idea of engage community, to have a common lexicon around the fact that, hey, we all experience difficult things. And if we can remove the isolation and the alienation, if we can have a common lexicon about how we talk about survival and hold, show up and hold space, Jason, to your beautiful point of be mindful show up with curiosity and compassion and engagement, creating the invitation, as Dr. Luana, you just said, to say, I'm here and I'm not pushing you to tell the story because that can result in a re-traumatization or the onset of trauma. Instead, it's that I'm with you. I'm linking arms, whether it be in a one-on-one -on -one with our family and our friends or as a community, creating that psychologically safe space to come together. So important. Um, and, and Dr. K, you said the body remembers. I mean, you said the brain remembers, excuse me. And it made me think the body also remembers. <laughs> um, we haven't really talked much about that yet. The mind-body connection. And, um, you know, it, in, I'd say recent years, there's uh, begun a bigger kind of broader understanding that, you know, the body does remember trauma. And so I'm wondering for you all, if maybe for the audience to explain, like, what does this mean? And then also how, how can we take care of our bodies after trauma um, to help heal kind of physically as well as psychologically and mentally? Yeah, I think oftentimes we feel before we think. So if we've experienced a traumatic event and we start to remember it, we're, just going, we're going to feel it in our bodies before we start to think and process what happened, what didn't happen, what were all of the surrounding factors. But we may feel the anger. We may feel the shame, the embarrassment, the sadness, the anxiety, and that's how it can show up. You know, so often when I'm working with someone and I'm 
maybe going over exposure ex exercises. And I can tell when we're thinking about certain things for them to do, they can, I can see it like in their body. I can feel or see the anxiety starting to show up. They may be having a, a thousand thoughts at that moment, but they may also have one pronounced feeling or emotion that's starting to be debilitating, even before they're actually attempting the exercise. Yeah, to build on that, it, it's fascinating. Our, our amygdala creates a case, and it's a case for self as we grow up across the course of our lives. And the case is a beautiful acronym for our cognitions, our autonomic, so kind of our basic mind-body functioning, our somatosensory, how is our body interpreting the world around us, and our emotions. So the case for self, the case for survival, or the case for trauma. And the amygdala plays a critical role in guiding all of our information processing. It's actually four times faster than our cognitive brain. And so when we're working with trauma, if our amygdala is encoded and reacting to stressors or trauma, our, we're bringing the body in is critical, working with the primal landscape of the brain, because the cognitions are, we call it the pokey puppy. They're very slow to the game when our sense of the world is threatened. And those emotions, Jason beautifully highlighted, they are the driving force behind all of it. And the wonderful opportunity is we now know how to work directly with the electrochemical brain. That's those psychosensory tools like EMDR, havening techniques, brain spotting, somatics experiencing, the way we anchor into the body to work from the bottom up. Because we're ancient creatures, fundamentally. Our, our amygdala is 300 million years old. Our thinking brain is 70 to 100,000 years old. So our amygdala has been doing something right to hang out. She's old guard. And she builds that case and helps design the world around us. And there's a lot of really cool opportunity within that. Love it. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and Jason, you mentioned exposure therapy. And I think it would be helpful uh, to talk a little bit more about what are some of the most effective evidence-based ways to treat trauma. Part one of the question. Part two is how do you know which which form of treatment is best for you? Because, you know, one size doesn't fit all, really. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start. Um, so, yes, exposure therapy is one aspect of prolonged exposure therapy where you're helping that person walk through what they've experienced in a very uh, therapeutic way. So it's very structured. It's very guided. You're going to help them process the emotions after they've shared the event. And then you're also going to help them build up to exposing themselves to situations, places, people, or feelings that they've been avoiding. Now, this takes course, you know, over other, um, this takes place over the course of, of maybe months or weeks at a time. But you, to answer the second part of your question, as far as how do you decide, you have to kind of, pr I present it as a, a menu. So if you're going to Cheesecake Factory, there's all these options, right? <laughs> And you don't know which one you want, but you have to kind of, maybe you converse with the waiter. Okay, I like this, I'm allergic to that. And that way you can make the best decision. So I take the same approach with treating trauma too. So I'll give them a couple of different options and kind of give them a rundown of what this looks like. Um, prolonged exposure is very, uh, you know, talk intense. There's a lot of activities. CPT is going to be very heavy in writing. So you kind of let that person know and they can decide what's the best fit for them. I so agree with Jason. I think it's really important. And I think it's the beginning of the healing journey to give the power back to them and for them to understand that they have control over their life, right? But often when you have traumatic experiences and PTSD in particular, it feels like the world's uncontrollable. The only bad things are going to happen. And I think I'm just going to slow down because Jason is so good. He's like, gave us all the treatments. And, um, but I wonder if people even know what they really are, right? So, and so prolonged exposure really is relieving the traumatic event and being able to do real life exposure like Jason was talking about or imaginal exposure. The other type is cognitive processing therapy, which is really about your belief system around the trauma. And, you know, there is EMDR. I think Dr. Kate already mentioned EMDR as well. I'm unfortunately not training EMDR, so I, I won't comment on it. Maybe one of the two of you can explain a little more. But I, I think it's important for the person to know there is more than one type of treatment. 
that you don't have to be stuck with one. And, you know, some of us are training different types. I have often said to patient, okay, if you have a strong preference for P, prolonged exposure, let's start there. And if in three or four weeks we see no gains, let's shift. Right. This is your brain. And we are trying to rewire your brain by teaching you skills. Um, but you're in the driver's seat. And sometimes we have to pivot. And that's OK, too. And beautifully said the the menu. I love the Cheesecake Factory menu. That's brilliant. That thing is literally that thick. It's incredible. <laughs> and so we talk a lot in my practice and in the trainings that we lead about the kind of acronym soup of trauma treatments. And because there's a lot of them and they run the, the gamut from our cognitive down into our really amazing mindfulness, somatic experiences and everything in between. And trauma manifests in so many different ways, whether it be avoidance, substance use, depression, you know, the diagnosable PTSD, the insomnia, fibromyalgia. There are so many different ways that traumatic experiences arise and manifest in our day-to-day -day lives. And it's unique to every single person. And that's why I'm kind of biased towards the neurobiology is like, we all have brains and then our brain's keeping us alive based on what it's learned through the trauma and how do we work within that. All of these modalities are really powerful and they're wonderful. And when we're looking at finding a trauma-informed clinician, one of my colleagues also talks about finding a trauma-proficient clinician. That's Kim Sun, she's amazing. And the through line of having both trauma-informed and trauma-proficient, I think as trauma experts request that we step outside a specialized focus on one intervention and ensure that we have the capacity to meet our clients where they are and meet our communities where they are, because it is so unique how their system has learned to survive. And fundamentally, that's what it is. The symptoms, the manifestation is about the mind body going, that worked, this is how I survive, or whether it be intuitive or oftentimes counterintuitive. And to Dr. I so appreciate what every, everyone is saying here. I, I, you know, I, I'm really hearing this common thread of empowerment, whether or not it, it's what you were seeing, Jason, around like having choice, collaborating with your clinician um, and what Dr. Kate and Luana are saying around like flexibility and giving the power back. And this just feels so important for survivors of trauma, where a lot of trauma can be about a loss of power and control. Um, so this does feel very vital. And I apologize, Jason, I, I cut you off. So what were you about to say? Oh, I was just going to add to Dr. Kate's point, the trauma-informed uh, and trauma-proficient clinician is most important. I've, I've never had someone say to me, I'm so glad you helped me with PE or CPT, but they'll say, I'm so glad you listened, or I love the way you reflected back what I, but they, the modalities are important to have, but it's really how you, how you show up as, as a person and clinician. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a few questions in the chat. Um, we'll see how many we have time for, but I've really been loving this conversation so far, but it's been dominated by my own questions. So let's hear, let's hear what's in the, the question box here. So somebody asked about trauma bonding, which we, I hear in my clinical practice a lot, I see in social media a lot, it's kind of like a, a buzzy term. Um, so I appreciate the question. The question is, how do you connect without trauma bonding? Anyone have thoughts on, on that, especially in, in light of what we were saying around the importance of connecting? Okay, I will I will jump in on this little bit of self-disclosure because my, my new book that's coming out, I talk about being in a trauma-bonded relationship with somebody where it was always as though our developmental journeys found one another and we're like, oh, you're matching the things that I was missing and I'm matching the things you were missing. And now we are both parts of a perfect puzzle. And how that ultimately, we met when we were, I was 18, created a sense of self that was reliant on another person, a codependency. 
And so when we're, tr there's trauma bonding can arise in many different ways. It can show up in such a way of we've both been through really hard things and let's bond through that pain. And that becomes the through line of the relationship that can create an ongoing pattern of re-traumatization. Trauma bonding can come through a way of codependency of we're completing different experiences and patterns in each other's lives that we almost cease to exist without one another. And in my experience, my partner ended up passing on, and that's what led to me developing PTSD, was he died a week before our wedding, and my sense of self just, whew, I had no idea who I was anymore. And for context, I was already, a I've been studying trauma and neuroscience for 10 years at that point, just to highlight, it doesn't matter what we know, when we're going through it, trauma can and will impact anybody who's in the midst of it. But trauma bonding can feel very safe because, oh, I'm being seen to the community piece and also be very dangerous because of the loss of self or the ongoing repetition of the trauma symptoms, triggers, and patterns that continue to build throughout the course of that relationship. Thank you for that. Yeah. Did anyone else want to add here? So I think I, you know, the question also had this piece of like, how do you bond without just you having the trauma be the common denominator? And I think Jason had sort of talked a little bit about that earlier, sort of this idea of meeting people where they are, but not having the trauma be the thing that you're bonding on. And so what are the other things that you can support their person, right? What are the things that you did before? And, and I'm not suggesting you ignoring that something happened, but you want to create a healthy, balanced, secured relationship that does not need to be talking about the trauma. Because that, as, as Dr. Kate said beautifully, leads to traumatization, leads to more trauma sim symptoms. And, you know, you lose, I think you did beautifully, um, you lose yourself. And, and then when that a person is not there, what we see is that we disappear. And so connect on the common denominators of things that bring both of you up. And, and the other piece is develop your sense of self that is separate from the trauma. The trauma happened, happened to you. It's awful, but that's not who you are. And I think doing that allows you to have your own sort of foundation so that you can move on. Really important. And, and yeah significant reminder. Um, and I, I love this idea of having kind of three dimensionality in a relationship so that you don't further lose yourself if it's kind of all about the trauma. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I can't help myself. I have to sneak in one more question that's here, even though we're almost out of time, but somebody asked about stigma and we haven't talked as much about stigma. So maybe we can do a, a quick response to this question around um, stigma and shame and guilt as it relates to trauma. Um, and I know we've spoken a little bit about it, but would love to hear if anyone has thoughts on like, what's the antidote to trauma-based shame, trauma-based guilt and, and self-blame? I'll say, when you think about blaming yourself or the shame that comes with trauma, you want to look at what narrative or what story are you telling yourself about what happened to you and list out those thoughts. I always advise people to journal, put it on paper, so then you can see if some of these thoughts may be irrational or maybe you're being very hard on, hard on yourself before even seeking out support. Because if you feel like a lot of shame, embarrassment, guilt, you may not even feel comfortable talking to anybody about what you've experienced. So it's going to be hard for you to break the stigma if there's so much overwhelming shame that you won't seek out professional support and you, you certainly won't talk to your friends and family about what you've been through. Yeah, I love the, and the through line of survival. So when we've been through something really hard, our brain is neuroplastic, it adapts. And we actually have a specific type of neuroplasticity called stress-induced structural plasticity. And this for me was huge in eradicating my own shame. I sometimes wish I had a card that I could hand to people. I had PTSD, don't mind me. And when I started to really dig into the neuroscience of neuroplasticity and the, and the new research that was coming out, because a lot of this is brand new research, when something happens, our survival brain clicks in and goes, I'm building that case. 
And my case for survival will guide how I'm showing up in the moment. And would we shame a puppy or a kitten or another human for trying to stay alive? No. Would we assume they should feel guilty for trying to stay alive? No. It's a biological principle of who we are. And so why do we bring that inward? And so in those moments of chaos and those trauma triggers and those symptoms, I, I like to invite my clients and I do this myself. I go, okay, high five, Amy. You're trying to keep me alive, strong work. And we're not in the trauma anymore. It's 2023. So good job, brain. Thank you for loving me fiercely. And let's try on something new. And that creates a space to go in a different direction and also brings us back to self and personal empowerment. My brain's fighting for me, not hurting me. Makes me think about kind of even healing the relationship between you and, and yourself, you and the brain in that way. Yeah. Well, I think, I think what you all just said is wonderful. I love the idea of writing it down creating some distance, getting some perspective. Um, this idea that how could there be anything wrong with just trying to survive? It's, it's what we're meant to do and what that looks like, you know, is certainly influenced by our experiences, you know, traumatic or, or otherwise. Um, you all have given us such valuable insight, knowledge and tips here today. Um, would love to hear from each of you if you have any last, um, you know, words of wisdom or, or thoughts that you wanted to offer our audience that we haven't gotten to yet. I'll jump in. Um, I think the most important thing is to know that there is good help that you can heal. So you're not alone. You don't have to feel that shame as we're talking about. Um, our thinking is what maintains a lot of that. And so really working to overcome um, and thrive again. And I'm confident we can all do it. I think a lot of times when we've been through trauma, we're really hard on ourselves and we're mad at decisions that we made or that we didn't make. And I, I like to think of it as, um, I think it's Monday, Monday morning quarterbacking. So you can't go back and do all of the plays over. If you knew this play would work, you would have done that, but you didn't. So we want to give ourselves much more grace and embrace the, the support that we have. And as Dr. Kate mentioned earlier, think about how you would talk to someone else. Use that same language, use that same tone, use that same compassion for yourself. We talk a lot about turning to the past to learn and not to return. So turning wounds into wisdom and pain into personal empowerment. And there is a lot more opportunities, more so now than ever, to do our own self-healing work, to partner with our brains, to harness the power of neuroplasticity, to bring that home. Because we know that therapy is a privilege. It's not a right. Access to strong mental health professionals is, there's just not enough of us. And there are a lot of incredible professionals out there who are doing amazing work disseminating this information, including Mental Health Coalition and all of your incredible partners who are great. And so it's, it's leaning in to the difficult moments and remembering that feeling it creates the space to heal it. And we're all worth the healing journey and it is really fundamentally possible. And the tools and the access and the information is out there. Amazing. Thank you. I want to hold on to everything that each of you said. It was so wonderful and important. Um, we do have to wrap up, but I, I do want to highlight the Mental Health Coalition's roadmap to trauma and PTSD once more, especially because I know there are some questions in the chat that actually you can find the answers to in the roadmap. And um, that's free online. Um, also want to thank Big, big thank you to each of you, uh, our panelists, for joining us. It's been lovely to have you. Uh, MHC has, has put our panelists' social media information in the chat, so go on and follow them there. Um, and just want to say to our audience, thank you for being here. This is 
a tough subject, an important subject, um, and, and just good luck to everybody on, on your healing journey. Thank you and take care. Thank you. Thank you. This is Thank amazing. You. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Be gentle.